I'd like to invite uh, our good friend. We travel together. <laughs> yes, yes and we, have, we share the same hotel. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So, does it work? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Fine. please go ahead. <laughs> and Cypher Security. You. So, um, let me start with the fact that I really love that the presentation from Cisco was directly yeah. before my own. So, um, as mentioned, you all hear really often the word trust. We all need to trust data, we need to trust our devices, and I need to trust my sender. Um, and, yeah. So, but where does all, should all the trust can come from? Or where you can store the trust? What will be the, manif the manifestation of the trust? It's basically an, based in cryptography, and that's what we are doing. We are not a solution partner at Encypher. Um, the only thing we are building is hardware security modules, which are only used as a trust anchor for your PKI, for also systems um, Cisco ten, can deliver for your SSL tr um, termination and so on and so on. But you need a place where you can store your secrets, where you can store your secret key, where you can store your certificates, where on all the trust we are need in this world outside is stored. So, but as long as I will start with some examples again, um, what could especially happening in the IoT world if you think, not think about trust or you strictly handling your trust the wrong way or you trust strictly the wrong persons or the wrong systems? Just in October, we had a release of 11 urgent cybersecurity vulnerabilities only based on one module used in many, many IoT devices. Um, what was the fact behind it? It's just one module, but it was trusted. And it was trusted on IoT devices um, with no possibility of revocation of this trust. So we had no strict PKI behind it with a possibility to revoke your used um, certificates, for example, for code signing. So what's happened here? We have some threats afterwards with, with the possibility to take control of the devices. Um, we can, the, the attackers can change the function of the devices just by using a trusted module on your device. Um, yeah, until we can only prevent the proper function, so you can destroy the device in the latest state. The scope, uh, yes, um, the vulnerable, vulnerable component was embedded in multiple versions of different operating systems. And, for example, it was an imaging system, for example, infusion pumps, it's not a good idea using an infiltrated infusion pump. This can, preventing this can save lives, and also with Anastasia machines. One of the funniest threats we had in the, for sure, yes, in this year, we had 10 gigabytes of data stolen from a casino just by changing the functionality of an, a thermometer of an aquarium. So, and that's, um, as well, um, they are strictly don't provide trust. They don't make use of trust. Everybody who was able to connect to this device and find an exploit voice was able to, to upload their own bot, their own malware, to misuse a simple thermometer. And for normal, nobody is thinking about that uh, my aquarium in my casino, which delivering some temperatures to my mobile phone, um, needs trust, for sure. Exactly, this needs trust too. Here, again, was infusion pumps. Um, an IoT network in a real small form, it's the CAN bus within our all cars. It's vulnerable by design. So actually, many, many persons in the automotive are working on it to bring only trust inside your car. Can one um, ECU in the car trust another ECU? Can you trust the data? Is my sensor that is sending my data only my data? It's all based on crypto now based on cryptography. Yeah, another funny attack, a car wash attack, just by misusing a car wash machine. 
Alexa is recording private conversation. Okay, for normal, it's a job for Alexa to also record your data. But it sends your conversations to some contacts without checking if the contact is a trusted person for me with allowance to use and hear my data I speak at home. We have another threat on robotic vacuums um, driving to my house. Seems okay, um, it's not a big problem that my vacuum roboter has a camera on it, but also we had no trust and the possibility to attack these devices and people were able to watch in your house, in your room, in your living room, where the vacuum is driving again. What can happen? Everybody can know what's in your house. If anybody is in your house, is able to break in and clear your house. We have Fitbit uh, tracking app, um, which is revealing US military, military locations in Iraq and Syria just by sending out, as well, untrusted data, which allows the enemies to find out the size and the scale of military locations in critical re regions in this world. And the same like with the Terminator with um, just a connected mousetrap. Mousetrap in the home network with untrusted communication is able, maybe, to bring data outside. This is where we work together with guys like Cisco. So they are working on the front, we are working in the behind to create the trust they are working with. So why is this is basically happening and what are the challenges for all the organizations out there? Um, let me say so, many persons out there are really overblown in mind just by the first two points. You have a big load of projects big load of full-scale projects actually in the market and you have many 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 POCs to work with and you have to handle the ownership of some governance questions but what often is failing what is about a security and where does all my data has gone so yes and this is a loop always where does all my data gone and what's about a security with a location and what is with a trust on the location my data is stored Yeah, in the IoT landscape, we had a list of possible threats. It's one of the most used threats is using the device as a network entry point. Also, with untrusted connection. You can use the bot as device, like as crypto mining on your device, or you can use the device for DDoS attacks or something like this. You can alter the function of an IoT device you can take the remote control of this device and the data can capture from the device. There are many solutions like device discovery, um, device authentication monitoring. We are strictly hooking on on these three parts. We are hooking on device authentication. Again, where we are at zero trust. Who has access to the device and what is allowed for the device? Basically none without trust. What is with the delivery of the patches and software updates out in the field? And how you can protecting your collected data from the devices? So for the authentication, we took place with some um, conferencing systems. Uh, what we are doing here is we just provide the trust anchor in form of an HSM for the PKI which creates the authentication tokens or handles the authentication tokens of all the devices out there, just to ensure that the conferencing system I'm using outside is really the conferencing system I want to use. Yeah. Same with patch and update. All the systems out in the field have the need for software updates. They can be vulnerable, you can have new functions to provide, whatever. All the code, ha code have to be signed. Also, this is done by using a PKI. What we, do here, what we only can do here is just sign all of the source code of the binaries we sent out onto our devices 
by using a PKI and the secure, by the PKI secured certificates, just to ensure that I am allowed and I am the person to update your device and this software is from me and not changed by somebody else. Next big part is the authenticity and the integrity of my parts. Just by, by doing code signing, building hashes about building and signing hashes with my, for my firmware, I can check the integrity. If my firmware I try to deliver is changed on its way to the device out in the field. Yeah. Our direct gotcha is just securing this one private signing key. This is what we are delivering our devices. We are just securing this key by death. If all bastions out there are failing, we try to protect exactly this one key where all other keys are based on, basically your root key. And we provide the cryptography in a secured environment to generate and use these keys. Where we are at the data protection cell itself. So data protection in the past was quite easy. So you have the data basically stored in your database, in your data center, and you, can, you were able or had to encrypt and decrypt the database, and all was done. But the devices out there, we have many, many data everywhere. We have it in motion, we have it in REST, we have it in our databases, we have it encrypted, decrypted. Um, the big problem in the market is basically the revocation of all of this data, taking the control just by revoking. Again, we can do this by using a BKI. If you are revoking the key this is used, which is used to encrypt your data, nobody is able to decrypt it out in the field. Same with suspension. You can only suspend the data by suspend the certificate. And this is a big thing outside. Many persons are using certificates out in the field, but nobody, or many not, is implementing a revocation system of your certificates outside. So it's fine that you are using one, but also you have to close the work of your, or finish the work with this one and only certificate out in the field. So in each scenario, scenario, when you are planning your IoT projects, there will be one, some point of brainstorming to do upfront. So you have to prioritize all the th possible threats by your severity, by the risk, and by the consequences. So we, in, in that case, you should follow the standard. Is the impact of a, th is, is the impact of a threat massive enough to, to create a big damage, basically on money or something like this. And you have to think about your major elements in the architecture you are using. It makes absolutely no sense using a PKI, but storing your certificate just by the use of a password somewhere on your application server. You will lose your certificate as fast as you can write your password. Some numbers. Um, all the numbers I'm telling here are based on the Panaman stu study, or study of the Panaman Institute. We are um, providing since the year of 2015, uh, yes. And every year um, we're asking um, 2,000 2, companies outside in the market about the use of PKI and their IoT trends. And this is what we are getting as the answers directly out of the field. The top threats are by 80%, 68% is altering the function of the device just by loading malware. Creates more work for the Cisco guys <laughs> just by finding this malware. 54% um, uh, by controlling the device remotely. 39% data stealing and data capturing and again 39% using the device as an access point into your private network. Back to the encryption. I told we all have to encrypt data on the devices. These are the scary numbers actually in the field from 2019. We have 28% of IoT devices out in the field that are using encryption. 
and we have only 25% of IoT platforms and repositories out there which are using encryption. Why? We hear it again. Mostly, it's uh, one big part is in, insufficient resources and insufficient skills. We need to go out and train all our people for using PKI, for using and implementing cryptography in all the systems. We have to focus on a clear ownership, clear responsibilities for persons with to work with all. Yeah. For this, PKI will in future play a critical role as a trust anchor. But what, what should a normal trust anchor bring with it outside in usage? The most is the scalability to handle millions of millions of certificates. It's quite different to the old school stuff um, where we are had 20 computers out there and one server with us. We're talking about millions of IoT devices connected to each other, and all of that should have an own certificate. All of, all of the devices should be, have the ability to authenticate itself and encrypt its data by itself. Next big part is the point for online revocation. As I told before, we need the possibility to revoke all the certificates and all the data we are using outside in this world. Good, and the support of elliptic curves is just to speed up and secure um, cryptography. Because um, actually we're basically using um, 2K, 3K, 4K RSA keys. But the big problem is RSA is going slower and slower and slower and slower as longer the key. Yes. So therefore we have support for, uh, or we also provide support for the standard elliptic curves. Then the devices should be certified in somehow. It's nice to talk about trust and who tells you out there that you can trust us? It's basically done by certificate, uh, by certifications, mostly used actually is the FIPS 142 um, level three certification. It just defines what, how the HSM is protecting your keys and how, how secured is the HSM itself. Also, how our company is working to create these HSMs. In the near future, we have to handle with, cloud, with some cloud deployment models. It's strictly increasing, uh, slowly increasing, you see, by 27%. And the ability to sign firmware, but actually, I don't like only the 26% by, by firmware signing should be a much higher Important, should have a much higher importance in the IoT world, actually. Again, what about the compliance? Who is telling persons out there, and what says the market they are want to see from us as an HSM vendor? Before it was a FIPS 142 level three certification. Um, on an increasing market, we have the common criteria, basic, uh, basically for remote signatures, and so on, but many, many, many companies are adapting the usage of common criteria, certifications, for also for using their IoT devices. Um, the rest is really depending on the market where you want to, have, where you want to act. Um, as I told, FIPS mostly is used um, in the USA, but it's based on uh, NIST certification. Common criteria is a part, counterpart from Europe. And the rest, we have some regional standards, um, like in Germany, um, for example, for payment cards. It's the decay certification from the BSI. So these are only regional certifications. Um, but we have also a turnover that many of these regional certifications are starting to adapt the common criteria certification. Um, on their own. So far, this was. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Excellent job. Very good. We're ready for your questions. Please go ahead. Yes, the security lady. Uh, I have two 
questions. Uh, I have two questions. First concerns mm -hmm. ages and modules. Mm -hmm. Will you change APIs from model to model? This is my first question. If HSM's changing the APIs from model to model, yeah. um, for normal, not. So you have a you have a you have a set of standard APIs. Um, the most used outside of the Microsoft world, for example, is PKCS11. From our side, we try to adapt the actual version of PKCS11 out in the field. And if there are no changes, we won't do any changes too. <laughs> Thank you. That's the great news. And the second question uh, concerns uh, PKI of uh, IoT. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what is your vision to, to cover everything? Because if we have lack of coverage of mm -hmm. PKI for some devices that are cheaper mm -hmm. and have uh, limited resources, limited uh, processing capabilities and limited memory. Mm -hmm. So they would become a botnet for the DOS mm -hmm. attacks and so on. So yeah. what is your vision? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Kevor. How do you scale uh, what you do? Like, uh, yeah, obviously, more devices, more IoT. How do you scale? Um, so, a PKI itself, uh, there we are on the possibility to handle millions of millions of millions of certificates. Um, basically, yes, it, it depends on the trust anchor you are using and basically on the HSM you are using in the back. Many, many HSMs using internal memory, for example, which limits the space of private keys you can handle. We are doing this not. And um, from our side, we are provided, uh, you can handle 5 million certificates if you want. The rest is the scale of a PKI. Um, and for normal, a PKI is not more like a database or a rela relational database over your certificate. So if the PKI is able to handle millions of certificates, we can do in the back. Absolutely. That's a very good question. Okay. And yes. Varam? Um, so you mentioned that uh, mm -hmm. you apply your PKI or whatever security technology to hardware, software, mm -hmm. and whatever pre-existing, right? I would say mm -hmm. functionalities mm -hmm. are there. Question is that, do you have a more preventive in terms of, for example, design for manufacturability for mm -hmm. the hardware? design for automation, for the software, hardware, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a guidance or a kit which would be designed for security? Okay. <laughs> and, and you would give that in advance to the mm -hmm. design house, not to end up with a problem at the end to apply your technology, but mm -hmm. rather be ready, pretty much qualified. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. Makes mm -hmm. sense, right? Makes sense, yes. Yeah. Any comment on that? Hmm? Design for security? Design for security that is preparing your security during design stage. Uh, yes, for sure. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense, yes. Excellent. Okay, thanks a lot, Worker. Thanks. Great job. <laughs> yeah. We appreciate that. <laughs>